Is the Holy Spirit in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Let's talk more about that. Hello, welcome to Christianity 411. I'm Doug Aldrich. I'm the pastor of the Second Congregational Church here in Winstead, Connecticut. Unfortunately, my cohort in crime, Pastor Tercio, Mark, won't, is not going to be able to be here with us today. So it's just you and us today. Today we're going to be talking about one of the harder aspects of theology, that person of God that I think most Christians and certainly folks in the world have the hardest time to understand, and that's the Holy Spirit. And so, as we talk today, let's ponder what the Spirit is. Now, if you noticed, I intentionally misspoke. When you start talking about what or it, you're not understanding the Holy Spirit correctly. One of the first mistakes people make when talking about the Holy Spirit is to call it an it. It's not an it. He's a he. And we read that in the scriptures. We read that in John 14, 26. Our Lord says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all that I said to you. See, the scriptures throughout call the Holy Spirit a He. And He's described in personal ways. He is described as having a will. He is described as having opinions. Now, he's a spirit. He's not a person in the physical sense. But in Christianity, according to the teachings of the church, we call him a person to describe that there is a difference between him and the Father and the Son. For God is a triune God. The Bible is very clear. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, as we hear in Deuteronomy. But yet, we read through the scriptures, there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's, there's the Holy Spirit. And they are different. They are distinct. When Jesus is being baptized and he's in the water, we hear the Father speak from heaven. We see the Son in the water, and then we see the Holy Spirit descending. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Let's ask the question in a better way. Well, he's the second person, sorry, the third person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit is probably the better term. And when we say ghost, we kind of think of Casper this day and age, and that's not what we're talking about. How is the Holy Spirit similar to the other two persons of the Trinity? Now, that's an easy question. Because whatever adjective you can use of, the, of one of the persons of God, whatever adjective you can use of God, of the Father, of the Son, you can use of the Holy Spirit. So words like all-powerful, all-knowing, wise, holy, they all apply to each person of the Trinity. They describe God and he who is one in three. It's where they're different is where it gets interesting. The difference is, and the key word, is the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. If you want a physical example, and physical examples are always kind of hard when talking about God, is he's almost like light who goes into all things. He goes every place. That Holy Spirit is a person of God that emanates from the Father in heaven by the Word, the Son, and goes into all things. If the Holy Spirit is removed from something, that thing ceases to exist. For all things have life and existence by God, and God upholds all things by His Spirit. We read that in Genesis. In Genesis, we hear about the Holy Spirit hovering over the, spirit, uh, over the surface of the deep, and He is in all things things. 
Nothing can be without the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is that person of God that goes everywhere. We talk about God being everywhere and also in heaven. Has that ever confused you? Well, the Father's reigning in heaven. The Son is at his right side. But when we speak of God being everywhere in all things, in all places, it's the Holy Spirit. That is who is in all things. And so the difference is, the Holy Spirit is that person of God which goes out. So you can think of the Father on the, on the throne, reigning in heaven. You can think of the Son as the eternal word of God who sent, was sent to earth, becomes human, and then goes into glory. But it's the Spirit of God who is through all eternity emanating from the Father and the Son into all things. And you see that throughout the scriptures. You see that in the big themes of scripture. You see that in creation, as we talked about before. You have the Father in heaven. Think of the Father enthroned in glory, King of all. And he is decreeing what shall happen. And how does he create everything when you read through Genesis? He speaks it. Out of nothing, he speaks everything into existence. And what is that speech? What is that word? What is the word of God? Jesus Christ. But it is by God's Spirit that hovers over the deep, that goes into all creation, that causes things, that makes things. When God gives Adam life, what does he do? He breathes into him. He forms out of, out of clay and then breathes. The word for breath there is actually the same word for spirit. And God gives his spirit to Adam, and he comes alive. So in creation, you see the Holy Spirit. But you also see it in redemption. The Holy Spirit plays a critical role in redemption. For the Trinity, again that notion that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is critical not only for creation, but how God saves his people, how God redeems all his creation. And you can think of it in a very simple way. God decrees salvation, or the Father decrees salvation. The Son accomplishes it, and the Spirit applies it. So you think of God the Father. What's the standard Sunday school way? Little kids understand this intuitively. How do you view God the Father? Well, he's that king enthroned in heaven. Absolutely spot on. That is how the scriptures describe God. He's enthroned in heaven. And the Father orders that his creation be redeemed. He orders that his people be saved. The king decrees. But how does the king save his people? Well, he has to send his son who is fully man, fully God, without sin, and he goes and dies for the sins of the world. That's how redemption happens. But how does anyone come to believe in the Holy Spirit? Sorry, how does anyone come to believe in the Son? It's by the Holy Spirit. That the person of God that goes in us, that makes us hear about Christ, who makes us believe, who gives us repentance, is the Holy Spirit of God. It is He who goes in us. And so therefore, for salvation, the Father decrees, the Son accomplishes it, gets it done, and the Holy Spirit applies it. If you have faith in the triune God, it is a sign that the Holy Spirit's in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in God's people. And it is a glorious thing. So to understand the Holy Spirit is you look at the scriptures and you look at creation and you look at redemption, those two great themes of the Bible. And you see each person in the Trinity active. But it is the Holy Spirit that goes in, that emanates from God. And it is a glorious thing. Now, the Holy Spirit can also be seen in prayer. Let me ask, who do you pray to? Well, I pray to God. If you're a Christian, that's the obvious answer. Do you pray to the Father? Do you pray to the Son? Or do you pray to the Holy Spirit? You can pray to all three persons. They're all God. And it's actually a wonderful aspect for your prayer life to stop and think when you pray to maybe I'll pray to each and think what each does. 
So you pray to the Father and you praise Him for what He has done. You thank Him that He's created all things, that He's in control, that He's enthroned in heaven. And then you pray to the Son. You thank the Lord Jesus that He became human and that He died for our sins and that He is Lord of all. But you can also pray to the Holy Spirit. And you say, thank you, Holy Spirit that you have come in me, and that I believe, and that I know, and please come in me more. Guide my steps, keep me from evil, and have me do what's right. You see, when you understand biblical theology, it improves not only your knowledge, but also your practice. You can look at creation and praise God that is spirits in creation, and how can you not see the beauty of a sunset or a sunrise and not see the work of the Holy Spirit? because all those things are upheld by him. How can you not, when you proclaim faith in Christ, realize the Spirit's in you and praise his name? But also when you pray, you can thank the Holy Spirit for giving us such mercies. But when you pray, who do you primarily pray to? Now, for most of us, when you say, you know, I pray to God, the first person that comes to mind, I would think, is God the Father. And that would be a good answer. Again, you can pray to all three persons. But you can also, in most of your prayers, you pray to God. But the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, is still there. Because who are you talking to when you pray, oh God, hear my prayers, oh God, be with me, oh God, thank you for this, oh God, help me out of this. Are you not speaking to the Father? You're speaking to him who is enthroned, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and glorious. But how does the Father hear your prayers? But through Jesus Christ. But through his Son. It is only by his blood that we can go. It is only through Christ, the go-between, that we can approach the Father. It is by the blood of Christ that the Father hears us. But the mere fact we are praying, it means the Holy Spirit is in us. Because the Spirit comes upon us as we read in Romans 8. And even if we don't know how to pray, if we pray even with groanings of pain or worry or joy, if it's in Christ, it's by the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, friends, the Holy Spirit is one of the most beautiful persons of God. Again, there's no division. There's only one God. But he has three persons. Fully man, sorry, fully the Father, fully the Son, and fully the Spirit. It's one plus one plus one equals one. But the Holy Spirit of God is that person of God who goes out into all things, gives life, and gives hope. He is glorious. So, know the Spirit by knowing the Son and honoring the Father. Know that the Spirit is in all things and is in us too. If you have life, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, an extra blessing. And that is a glorious thing. Let's talk more about how do we know if we have the Spirit. Let's talk a little bit more in detail after the break. So I'll see you in a few seconds. Pastors Mark and Doug invite you to worship with them. Mark shepherds the Goshen Congregational Church, which is located at 157 Church Road in Lebanon, Connecticut. Worship and praise service is on Saturday evening at 5.30 p.m. and the Sunday morning service is at 9 a.m. Doug pastors the Second Congregational Church of Winstead, located at 800 Main Street in Winstead, Connecticut, which is also Route 44. Sunday morning worship begins at 10 a.m., except during July and August, when the service starts at 9.30 a.m. You can learn more about the churches, including other worship opportunities and Bible studies, at their websites, found at www.goshenchurchct.com, and www.sccwinstead.org. Welcome back to Christianity 411. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. And let me ask, and you probably have had this question asked before, if you at least live in America, are you born again? Now, you hear that phrase used 
all the time, especially in the evangelical church. That question implies another one. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? As we chatted before, now the Holy Spirit's in all things. He is in rocks, he is in animals, he is in humans, he is in sinners, but he dwells in a special way in Christians because the Holy Spirit comes upon sinners and gives them new life, takes out a heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. And so as a pastor, I will be asked somewhat frequently, Pastor, how do I know if I'm born again? How do I know if the Holy Spirit's in me? One huge mistake that most modern American Christians make is they think that born again is something we do. If you think of it, the term itself is kind of crazy. It's as if when you were an infant that I'm going to make myself be born. No. The new birth that scripture talks about is something that God does. And we see that in scripture. If we take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, Father and Son are different, but yet they're equal. Who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. Do you hear that? Has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is by the Father's decree through the actions of the Son's death and resurrection by the giving of the Spirit that we are made born again. It's not something that we do. It's something that is done to us. And that's why the scriptures will say in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. It is God who makes us born again. It's not something we do. It's something that God does. He gives us new life. Well, but wait a minute, you might ask, then how do I know? How do I know if I really have this special life that only the Holy Spirit gives? Well, one common mistake people make is they associate the Holy Spirit solely with their emotions and their experience. Now, there's nothing wrong with emotion experience. Motion experience. If you have a good experience, if you have a good emotion, it is by the Holy Spirit. No doubt about it. But the Holy Spirit comes upon us and changes us and gives us faith. And one of the common mistakes most Christians make is they try to ask if their emotional state is correct. And if they have the correct emotional state, they, then they may be a Christian. And what the mistake they're doing is they're putting faith in faith. They're making the object of their faith their own faith. And they're making their faith an emotional state. You know, do I really believe this? And if I'm not really believing it, somehow I don't have the Holy Spirit. That's a dangerous trap. Because the object of our faith is not our own faith. Friends, your faith is going to go up and down. Mine does. There are times I am zealous for the Lord. I'm excited for the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet there's other times where I'm depressed, I'm in a funk, I might have doubts. And man, Satan is working on me. And so do I put my trust in my own faith? No, no. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so to ask yourself, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? You have to know who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And we see that in Scripture. Take a look at John chapter 16, verse 8. And he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So the main job of the Holy Spirit is to go into people and convict them of sin, convict them of righteousness, and understand that judgment is upon the wicked, and in particular Satan. 
And so if a parishioner comes to me and asks, Pastor, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? How do I know I, I, I am born again? I don't go looking for an emotional state. I don't go looking for a conversion experience. Because some people have dramatic ex conversion experiences, like the Apostle Paul, and some people have always believed. But the key thing is belief. And when we read in John that, that, again, chapter 16, verse 8, and we see what the Holy Spirit does, the first thing I ask them is their repentance. Do they know their sin? Do they know that by nature we are enemies of God, children of Satan, and spiritually dead. If you don't believe in the fullness of sin, and that's from Ephesians 2, chapters 1 through 3, if you don't believe in the fullness of sin, then you have no reason for a Savior and you have no reason for the Holy Spirit. And matter of fact, if you think you're not that sinful, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, whose main job is to come and convict sinners. But if you can say, yes, I know I'm a sinner, and I have no hope within me, then I ask, do you have faith? Because we read here in John again that the Spirit comes and convicts about righteousness. So are you trusting in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Him as one's Lord, Savior, and God? If the answer is yes, that's a sign of the Spirit. For only the Spirit brings conviction. Only the Spirit brings faith. And from that conviction, from that trust, one is a Christian. Because one is trusting not in themselves, but in Christ. But from that conviction comes then what? A life of thanksgiving. Of being thankful to God for what he has done. And therefore comes worship, therefore comes good works, comes praise, and all those things. Those are byproducts of the gospel. And they're caused by the Holy Spirit. And so if someone comes to me and says, Pastor, man, I'm really a sinner. I trust in Christ. I am struggling with the faith. I am trying to do what's right. But I keep on stumbling. But I want to believe. I follow Christ. My response is the Holy Spirit is greatly in you. For to realize that you're a sinner and to desire to follow Christ is a sign that he is in you and that you are born again. It is the people whose hearts are hardened, who don't care about these things, that I really worry about. You see, Christians are supposed to wrestle with sin. That's the mark of the Spirit. And do we wrestle with things throughout our lives? Yes. And that keeps us humble. And that keeps us always going back to the Spirit. But friends, never believe that you save yourself. It is Christ who has saved you. It is Christ who says you are innocent. It is Christ who says you are forgiven. Do you believe that or not? If you believe that, how can you then not for have thanksgiving? Your status has changed. You're no longer some child who's just wandering the streets, some orphan whose father is actually Satan but you now are God's child. And you have that new status solely by the blood of Christ. If you know that, the Spirit's in you. And if you know that, how can you not have thanksgiving? You see, our faith is in Christ. And faith comes by the Holy Spirit. Now you have to be careful what faith is. Faith is not, as the secular world likes to tell us, just belief with lack of evidence. That's not the biblical concept of faith. Faith is basically three very simple things. It is knowing, agreeing, and trusting. Knowing, agreeing, and trusting. I'll give you an example. I have faith in my wife. I have to know that she's my wife. I have to know this woman named Verna is my wife and no one else. Not only do I have to know that, I have to agree to it. Yep, we're married. Those are things of the mind. But there's one more thing. I trust her. I trust that she will do what's right. When she promises something, I believe her. I trust her to raise our child well. and She does a great job at it. 
That's what faith is, knowing, agreeing, and trusting. So, when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, do you know that he's Lord, that he's God, that he's Savior? Do you factually know that? Do you agree to it? It's like, yes, I agree to it. Those are things of the mind. Do you trust him? Do you trust him when he says your sins are forgiven? Do you trust him when he says you are his? Do you trust him that he will protect you and your soul no matter what ha may happen to this body and that you are his forever? If you can say, yes, I do, then you have the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not faith in faith. It's faith in Christ. The King has said we are forgiven. The King has said we are redeemed. It is by his precious blood that these things happen. Do you believe it? If the answer is yes, then you are his. And that answer of yes, Lord, is only by his Spirit. But if it's more than just a mere intellectual thing, for even the demons intellectually know Jesus is Lord, but if there is that willful trust which shows up throughout one's life, then you are very born again. Yes, you're going to wrestle with sin. Yes, you're going to have difficulties in life. That is the normal thing. I mean, Paul himself says, O wretched man, that I am who will save me from this body of death. That is an apostle, a born-again Christian, someone who's walking after the Lord fiercely, who admits he is still wrestling with sin. Now, should we embrace sin? Of course not. But it's the Spirit that brings conviction of sin. It is the Spirit who gives trust in Christ. It is the Spirit who gives us joy and thanksgiving. Friends, we all need to repent, we all need to believe, and we all need to give that thanksgiving. That's the Christian life in three very simple things. Knowledge of sin and repentance from it, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ from what he has done, and then showing thanksgiving by worship and good works for the new status we have in him. That is by the Holy Spirit. If you're trusting in Christ, you are born again, and the Spirit dwells in you richly. Amen. Well, I have hoped you enjoyed this show. Um, I hope you enjoyed our discussion about the Holy Spirit. If you want to read more about the Holy Spirit, best place to go, John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Those are the great chapters that describe the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Well, I hope to see you next time, and I pray that the Spirit be upon you greatly. And know this, Jesus Christ is a far greater Savior than you are a sinner. So go in Christ's name, and let us rejoice. Amen. Do not judge others, lest thy be judged. Don't feed pearls to pigs or give what's sacred to the dogs. Ask, seek, and knock, the way will be shown. Never take the path that's wide, choose the narrow road. Don't be like the foolish man who built his house on the sinking sand. He thought was strong and sound But when the rains came